but okay, if we yeah, I'll I'll quickly. I'm not going to do a lengthy introduction to the speakers. The biographies are in the conference booklet, and most of which you will know them anyway. But just say on my left is Richard Neville Bowen, who's currently a doctor, and I think also as a physician at the LSE. And on my right is, of course, to everyone in Murphy Davis Economics here at Brisbane. They're going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then I'm going to try and keep control of them. But both assured me I'm not needed. But I'll hand over straight away to Jamie. Right, thank you. I read uh, Man, the State and the War for the first time in 1971, and I owe much of my subsequent intellectual and even professional development to this book. The book's title is A Theoretical Analysis. It taught me how to do this, or how to engage in this type of activity. <clears throat> to be more precise, it is not so much a theoretical analysis as a meta-theoretical analysis I that the book engages in. It identifies various causal theories of war, assesses their relative significance, and offers a way of synthesizing them. However, it also contains a theory of international politics, or more precisely an argument showing why a rough equilibrium of power tends to emerge from time to time, even though no state brings this about intentionally. This theory is developed further in his later work, or later work, Theory of International Politics, but my focus today is on Ward's first book, surely the most successful PhD thesis ever written in the history of IR as an academic discipline. Now, as I've read and reread Mander State and War over many years, and here's the evidence, this is my exhibit number one. Uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> and also, I was reminded of the fact by looking at this exhibit number two, that this man has a green and red, you know, two men, but of course my red one has completely faded. <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> anyway, as I read and reread Manchester and War over many years, um, a number of increasingly rhetorical questions suggested and gradually articulated themselves in my mind. So let me explain what these are. War occurs because there is nothing in the international system to prevent it, says Waltz. But this surely is a trivial statement to make, as Waltz himself acknowledges at one point in the book. And surely there's nothing to prevent war either in the nature of man or of the state either. So why is it that the international system is given such prominence or special significance in this thinking? Isn't it after all the case that war occurs because human beings can and do fight, so isn't there something quite fundamental after all in the makeup of man that really ought to be highlighted? Waltz initially defines his three images as three different estimates, and this is his own word, uh, concerning the major cause of war, i.e. his three images are three contending interpretations <coughs> regarding causal significance, but he also uses the first, second, and third images as labels for the locations of causes. So for instance, when a leader of a state wants something and, he, and this contributes to an outbreak of war, Waltz think that this, or what he classifies as the immediate cause, belongs to the first and second images. And isn't he mixing up quite a few things here? And for what purpose? And um, are the three locations in Waltz's drug murder scheme comprehensive? Do all the causes of war fit into the scheme? Where, for instance, does an event or an act like the assassination of the Archduke fit in? Waltz talks of the permissive cause of war as though there is only one permissive cause, and he also talks of the underlying cause of war as though this meant the same as the permissive cause. <coughs> but surely there, are, there can be such things as the underlying causes of a particular war, e.g. World War I, and the underlying cause of a number of similar wars, e.g. great power wars of the 20th century, neither of which needs to qualify as the permissive cause of all wars. Now, Waltz also talks about the possibility, constant possibility, and the recurrence of war almost interchangeably. But surely, something can con uh, continue to be possible without ever happening, or very frequently, so is he thinking about a sheer possibility or some likelihood here? And how recurrent does he think war is? Is he simply pointing out that war would happen, as in rain would fall, or is he perhaps pointing to something more specific, e.g. rain in Spain stays in land? Sort of. 
Now, Waltz uh, is very effective in his criticisms of various prescriptions for peace emanating from the first two images. Uh, improving man and states, he rightly observes, would not enhance the chance of peace and might even lead to war, unless all the countries in the world were made to adopt the same measures at the same time, which could not be done given the decentralized nature of the international system. Now, if he has so efficaciously, and he does this, if he has so efficaciously disposed of the first two images earlier in the book, how come that in the book's conclusion he's still talking about them, the first two images, as having something to contribute towards the explanation of war? How have they been resurrected? And uh, I dedicate a third of my paper to examining a set of weaknesses in Wolf's overall argument that relates to these various puzzles. I cannot now go into the details of my exposition and critique, but here are some key points. And the argument does get quite complicated. Uh, first, I argue that it is not very meaningful to state that the fact that there is nothing in the international environment to prevent war is the permissive cause of war. In order to count as a permissive cause of war, what is said to be missing from the international environment must be such that its presence, rather in its presence, war could not happen at all. For otherwise, war could happen in the presence as well as in the as well as in the absence of the thing in question, in which case its absence cannot meaningfully count as war's permissive cause, for its presence too can permit war to happen. In any case, since nothing that can in principle exist in the international environment can ever rule out the very possibility of war, it is not very meaningful to talk about its absence as a permissive cause of war. And its absence from the international system clearly does not qualify as the permissive cause, uh, some permissive causes of war are found in the makeup of human beings, as revealed when humans are contrasted with, with non-human animals. Second, I draw attention to the fact that in the course of his discussion, Waltz places together certain, what to me are incongruous items in the within man and within states categories. The within man category is made to contain not only aspects of human nature and certain personality traits of some individuals, but also specific desires and fears on the part of particular individuals in concrete cases. The within states category uh, is made to contain not only the internal structures of certain kinds of states, but also particular acts of uh, uh, states that lead to war at a particular time. In other words, what particular individual states feel, think, and do becomes integrated into Walt's first two images or locations. Now, I used to find this move uh, on the part of Walt as simply unacceptable, a mistake. But I've now worked out why he makes or is compelled to make this, uh, this move. And since, for me, this is a discovery, I want to explain it a little further. There is, I suspect, a tendency to suppose that Wolf's three images are themselves three levels of analysis. You, you, you talk to anyone about Mandus State and War and say, oh yes, it's about three images, sorry, three levels of analysis. Um, however, as far as I can tell, and I did read this book last, this, this August, uh, with a tooth comb, and I think I'm right in saying, um, Wolf's never in fact uses the expression levels or levels of analysis anywhere in his book. It certainly doesn't appear in index, but I did go through the 270 pages or so, and I couldn't find them in those two words. I may be wrong, of course. Uh, and besides, his three images are three different estimates of where the major causes of war is found. That is, this is a way of classifying answers regarding uh, uh, relative significance of various causes of war. By contrast, the so-called level of analysis problem uh, as far as I can tell from my reading of David Singer's famous article, has primarily to do with where one should ask macro, sorry, whether one should ask macro level questions or micro level questions. Whether that is, one should ask questions about systemic phenomenon or questions about the behavior of its units. So all the three majors are about how to classify various answers and the level of analysis problem has to do with what sort of questions to ask. So clearly, the talk of the three images and the levels analysis talk are quite different things. 
But Waltz integrates these two different discourses in his overall story concerning the causes of war. Let me explain how he does this. Now, understood as three different estimates of the causes of war, the three images cannot be integrated into one story straightforwardly. It is not possible to say that X is causally more important than Y and Z, Y is more causally more important than X and Z, and Z is causally more important than X and Y at the same time. One way out of this is to say that X, Y, and Z are causally all very important, but in different senses. And this is what Waltz, in fact, does. According to him, man and the state are important because we cannot explain particular wars without reference to what they do. But according to him, the international system, the third level of the image, is important because it explains the possibility and recurrence of war in the international system. What must be noticed here is this. Waltz has found a way of combining the three images and produce an overarching image of world politics as a drama in which actors act to bring about changes in their relationships, say from peace to war, but within the setting that broadly shape their patterns or interactions. Uh, patterns of interactions. Note here that in producing his overarching story by combining the three images, Waltz has introduced the level of analysis issue in its proper sense. Let me explain. Waltz is here dividing the questions of war causation into two kinds, unit level or disaggregated questions regarding the causes of particular wars between particular states at particular times, on the one hand, and the system level or holistic question regarding the possibility and recurrence of war between any states at any time as a systemic feature on the other. And he's saying that unit level questions cannot be answered without paying attention to what human beings and states do, but that answers to system level questions are found in the nature of the international system itself. There is an important but often unnoticed transition, therefore, in man, the state, and war. It begins by asking where the major causes of, of war are found and offers a tripartite scheme as a way of classifying some standard answers. But the book's concluding message is the importance of separating micro and macro level questions, namely why a given set of states ended up fighting a particular war at a particular time on the one hand, and why the possibility and recurrence of war are features of the international environment. Um, now, it is often said that the three levels of analysis in Waltz, Man, the State, and War have collapsed into two in his theory of international politics. This is not quite so. In the first place, Waltz's three images are not levels of analysis. Secondly, the transformation from the one to the other already takes place in Man, the State, and War. And thirdly, it is not so much that the three levels of analysis are collapsed into two, for after all, there are only two levels of analysis, parts and whole. It is rather that the three standard arguments identified at the beginning of the book are synthesized as elements in the overall story or image of world politics as a drama, comprising actors and the setting, or agents and structure. And this separation or juxtaposition of agents and structure is in turn sustained by Walt's corporate incorporation of the micro-macro distinction into his thinking. Now, about this transition or switch from the talk of the three standard estimates of the major causes of war to the talk of macro-micro distinction based on the agent structure dichotomy has a cost. Waltz has to find a way of grafting the micro-macro dichotomy onto what, he, what was initially a tripartite scheme. It is easy to say that the first two locations or images were collapsed into two, but in so doing, Waltz moved or had to move away from the idea of the first location that is within man as having essentially to do with human nature of personality uh, traits. It was a rather different idea that what statesmen feel and think and do in particular circumstances also fall into this location. In a parallel fashion, he also moved or had to move away from the idea that the second location, the within states category, as having essentially to do with the internal structure of a given type of states, it was a different idea that the particular acts of states, or what states can be said by invitation to feel, think, and do in particular circumstances, also belong to this location. Uh, in case you are unsure of what I'm saying here, let me explain that Waltz uses two scenarios of war. Uh, one where A's desire for X, which B possesses, uh, causes war. The other where A and B are in security competition and mutual fear causes either A or B to attack the other. Uh, 
So in these two scenarios, Wolf is saying that desire or fear are the immediate causes of war, and because the desire or fear are entertained by the man of states, therefore immediate causes of particular wars belong to the first two images. And the line cause of war, the permissive cause of war in both cases is uh, the international system. Uh, I have recently read uh, Ned's book about the Kamala, Kamala book, uh, Cultural Theory of International Politics, in which he says that this way of thinking, in terms of two scenarios, war caused by desire and fear is typical of modern conception of war. Um, if you go back to the ancient Greeks and so on, you can find that honor is a third dimension. Uh, but that's a different story. We'll deal with that when we have a Lubo fest. <laughs> now, in any case, concomitantly, uh, with the shift from the three images to the le two levels of analysis, um, having already criticized arguments from human nature and those pointing to the internal structure of states as yielding inadequate prescriptions for peace, Waltz is now shifting his target. The causal factors found in the two locations, such as what states or states can feel, think, and do, is now arguing only contribute towards explaining particular wars as the immediate causes, and therefore, in his estimate, less significant than the underlying causes of all wars, which he finds in the electoral structure of the internal system. And this is the crunch. If what is calling the permissive cause of war really deserves to be treated as the underlying cause of all wars, his effective redefinitions of the first two images may have been worthwhile, in my judgment, they have made the overall, overall argument even less sustainable. In the paper, I also discuss some other weaknesses in Walt's meta-theoretical treatment of the causal theories of war. Most importantly, I suggest that his drug archive scheme makes sense and tends to be treated as the obvious way to classify things, partly because it captures our common experience of living at the same time as men and citizens. Uh, to borrow the expression uh, used in Andrew Rinkley's famous book, Men and Citizens in the Theory of International Relations. Um, the tripartite scheme also makes sense in the context of Walt's book because most of the writers whose views he examines are modern political theorists who thought in terms of the three ontological units, individual human beings, states, and system or society of states. But of course, not all causes of wars can be classified uh, neatly into these two slots. In my own book, and this is exhibit number two, uh, on the causes of war, yeah, I suggest that we think of the causes of wars in terms of the process of transition from peace to war, and that this process can be understood as a concatenation of three kinds of causal factors, human actions, mechanistic processes, and chance coincidences. <coughs> but that is another story, and we are definitely not having a another fest. So. <laughs> now, it should by now be clear that, in my judgment, Walt's man of state and war has many problems in its meta-theoretical treatment of the causal theories of war. But by no means am I suggesting that it is a bad book. In fact, uh, this is entirely parasitic on uh, man of state and war, and it is because of this that I got a uh, chair in another university before I came here, so I really owe everything to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, um, there are very many astute observations scattered in Manderstein and War. The book is extremely rich in illustrating a wide range of international thought, and in this it is at least as impressive as and possibly more so than Martin White's work, partly because Kurt Walt didn't get camped wrong the way that White did. Now, in this connection, however, I just want to make one observation. It has been noted more than once during this conference that Walt is skeptical of the view that human nature is the major cause of war. His famous line, which has already been quoted at least twice so far, says that human nature may in some sense have been the cause of war in 1914, but by the same token, it was the cause of peace in 1910. A rhetorical implication of such a statement may be that human nature has therefore nothing much to do with war. The statement, however, does not rule out the possibility, and I'd say indeed the fact, that aspects of human nature are part of the necessary, though not sufficient, conditions of war. In any case, if Walt is suggesting here that human nature has little to do with war, then the same logic applies to international anarchy. There was nothing to prevent war in the international system in 1914 or in 1910. So, as the meta-theoretical exercise regarding the various causal theories of war, my view is that Walt's book has a number of problems. However, the book also contains a theory of international politics, as I said at the beginning, or the theory of the balance of power. 
Given international anarchy and given the state's desire for survival, a rough equilibrium power would emerge without anyone or any state intending it, according to this theory. There has been some discussion during this conference about whether both theory involves assumption of rationality. It does, uh, in the sense that it assumes states to be generally oriented towards ensuring its survival. This is the same kind of rationality as the one H.L.A. Hart has in mind when he works out the minimum content of natural law on the basis of the assumption, among others, that we are not talking about a, so we are talking about a society here, not the suicide club. Though no longer strikingly new, Bull's argument contains an early articulation in IR of a mechanistic theory of the balance of power. Causal mechanisms referred to in such a theory are said to be in operation where we are induced to behave in a certain uh, way because of the working of our mind or body, because the social environment induces us to think and act in a particular manner, or where through the workings of the system in which our actions take place, they lead to unintended consequences. Wall's balance of power theory points to the second and the third of these paths. The anarcho-structured international system, plus the uh, unit's desire to survive, induces states' leaders to think and act, or act even against what they prefer or preach, in such a way as to prevent one great power from becoming overwhelmingly dominant, and this tends to produce the balance of power politics, whereby the key players try to balance each other individually or by shifting alliances, possibly leading to a rough equilibrium power among the major powers, even if that end result is not what they consciously try to achieve. Needless to say, mechanistic processes do not always work, and the conditions under which they work are often difficult to enumerate, especially in the social sphere. Hence was wisely vague formulation that such a tendency for the balance of power as a policy and an outcome will manifest itself, and I quote, under certain conditions, conditions that have existed in international politics. For me, this really shows the importance of historical knowledge, or I'm even tempted to say the primacy of historical knowledge to theoretical speculations. Now, this part of the book has been superseded, as I said, by a theory of international politics. Uh, but for me, the books, the Man, State, and War's main significance lay in the fact that it showed the possibility, it showed me the possibility and importance of philosophical engagement in the study of world politics. Waltz has shown me the way, I simply follow the path. Have I been writing the arguments I have advanced along the route? I hope some of the time. And here is my exhibit three. Dear Mr. Suganami, thank you for giving me a copy of your paper, which I was able to read while still in London. I'm sorry that I was unable to attend the panel, but I found the paper cogently and constructively argued. Signed, Kenneth Holt. <laughs> <laughs> if Walt says my argument is cogent, I must be right at least some of the time. <laughs> he is the king of thought, after all. Thanks very much for naming. Okay, straight over to men. Thank you very much, because that might work. Can everybody hear me? Let me start my watch. Okay. I thought about the four or five books that most influenced me in my university years. And there are indeed four. And uh, Ken Walter's Man, State, and War is one of them. Uh, two books from the 1930s, one from the 1940s and two from the 1950s. And I read the Waltz book basically when it came out. I was a student at the University of Chicago at the time. The two books from the 1930s were Schumpeter's Imperialism and Social Classes, which, in my mind, created a, a sense of the sociological understanding of, of war and conflict. The second volume, which was extremely influential for my subsequent uh, work, was Harold Laswell's World Politics and Personal Insecurity, uh, published in 1938, which attempted to bring uh, psychological uh, insights into the study of international relations. The third book was Carl Deutsch, who later became a mentor of mine, and Nationalism and Social Communication. The fourth, published in 1948, was uh, Hans Wagenthal's Politics Among Nations. He was my mentor in Chicago and I his research assistant. And 
the Ken Waltz 1959 plan, state, and law. What I derived from that were two important insights. Uh, first, how murky Carl Deutsch, excuse me, how murky Hans Wolkenfeld was about uh, causation because he really had arguments at all three levels uh, running together, which he failed to disaggregate. By reading Waltz, I understood and could uh, critique Morgenthau in a way I could not in the absence of having read that book. But more fundamentally, it alerted me to the need to understand the great political philosophers and what they had to say about the great questions which endure to our own time. And my more recent work has increasingly drawn on political philosophy for that end. And for this, I really have uh, Ken to thank for putting me down that road. My paper today is not going to address uh, Ken Walls. Uh, maybe this is a, a pleasant change, not that there's anything wrong with addressing Ken Walls, but it's been the focus of, of almost uh, every other paper. Uh, rather, I'm going to go after what might be seen as a research tradition that is critical uh, of Ken Waltz. I'm going to criticize it severely. And by inference, uh, uh, Ken and his ideas look better after disposing of the claims of power transition theories. The principal reason, however, why I am tilting at power transition theories has, has nothing to do with uh, either Ken. Uh, but rather with the um, dominant use of power transition as the framework for studying how the United States should respond to the rise of China. Policymakers, journalists, scholars alike, so many of them have framed their analysis of how we should respond to China in terms of power transitions assumption that when a rising power pulls abreast of a hegemon, the likelihood of war increases dramatically. Uh, Assistant Secretary Susan Scherk of State, uh, when she was in power and gave a speech, uh, repeatedly argued that this was the framework that was being used by the State Department uh, to analyze the rise of China. Well, I'd like to pull the rug out uh, from underneath this uh, power transition uh, framework and argue that there are no grounds for thinking that power transition theories historically have any empirical support. And in fact, uh, the historical evidence makes it enigmatic that anybody ever took them seriously to begin with and raises the really interesting problem of uh, why power transition theories uh, remain uh, an active research program and even more uh, why they're chosen as the appropriate framework for the study of the rise of China and its consequences for international relations. As most of you uh, probably know, there are uh, two dominant theories of power transition. There are, of course, others. Uh, the Organsky and then Organsky and Kugler formulation and the Robert Gilpin uh, formulation. In my paper, which is available to all of you, so I'm only going to summarize its, uh, its general arguments, I describe both of those theories and lay out their claims. But I argue that they and other power transition theories share a number of assumptions in common, and it's those assumptions I would like to uh, uh, exposed to an empirical analysis, and it's really a joint project uh, conducted with my uh, colleague Benjamin Valentino, uh, who is uh, among the uh, greatest, uh, most resourceful uh, scholars uh, of his generation that I know. He received his tenure last year. He's written a superlative book on comparative genocide, which I recommend to, to all of you. He's now finishing a project on civilian casualties in war, which is both a qualitative and quantitative study. Uh, ben and I uh, read through this literature and uh, discovered really that there are uh, four fundamental assumptions of power transition. Uh, in contrast to Ken Waltz, who argues for the anarchical nature of the international environment, uh, power transition theorists 
a belief that it's ordered, that there is always, or uh, at most times, a dominant power, and really a hegemon, uh, who is able to impose uh, a status hierarchy, even rules about how foreign relations and wars should be conducted. That hegemon orders the system in a way to benefit itself, both materially and with respect to prestige. Assumption number one. Assumption number two, which follows from assumption number one, is that other powers are unhappy with this relationship because the dominant power is seeking advantages at their expense. Rising powers, in particular, feel the need to assert their authority and hopefully to remake the system so it benefits them to supplant uh, the dominant power. Uh, that becomes a fundamental cause of war. That's assumption number three. And here power transition theories uh, differ both with respect to uh, their predictions of who starts the war and how likely it is. Organsky and Kugler offer the most uh, mechanical formulation telling you at precisely the time a uh, war will occur when the growth rates, differential growth rates of the two powers uh, lead to something approaching parity. Uh, and it will be the rising power that starts the war. Uh, Gilman, by contrast, argues it is the dominant power that starts the war to retain its hegemony. But war is only one of four possible strategies it can follow. So his theory, while more nuanced, is less determined. Both sets of authors offer cases uh, which they believe substantiate their claims. Uh, Gilpin offers the Peloponnesian Wars, the Punic Wars at World War I. Organsky and Kugla limit themselves to the modern period and talk about the wars of Louis XIV, uh, the Napoleonic Wars, uh, 1914 and 1939. Interestingly, none of these authors engage their cases. Gilpin has one page uh, discussing Thucydides and takes the most superficial uh, reading of his uh, authorial comment in Book 1, 23, 5 and 6, that it was the rise to power of Athens and the fear it inspired in Sparta that was the underlying cause of the war. Um, he doesn't discuss his other cases. Organsky and Kublin don't discuss any of their cases empirically. They only show uh, their statistical results of differential growth rates and their impact on power. The additional implication that flows from these theories is that hegemonic war, one way or another, should resolve the conflict between dominant powers and challenged. Uh, ben and I uh, have looked at these assumptions and have put together a data set, which I'll describe in a moment, to test them. We find no evidence for any of the assumptions or its principal implication. With respect to there being a hegemonic power capable of imposing order, uh, I turn here to this wonderful book, a short book but profound, um, The Balance of Power in World History, which one of the authors is sitting in our audience, Richard Little, uh, William Walforth and Stuart Kaufman uh, being the others. And they looked at uh, the nature of the system uh, from 1500 on and found only one decade in which there was unipolarity. Uh, all of the others were bi or multipolarity, and in none of them, they argued, was there a hegemon uh, capable of uh, imposing order uh, on the system. In the absence of a hegemon uh, that's capable of doing this, the fundamental assumption of the theory uh, disappears. In fact, what we find and we need to make a very important distinction between a hegemon and a leading power. In many decades, we have leading powers, whether it was Louis XIV's France, or Wilhelmini in Germany, or the United States. And many of these leading powers sought to become a hegemon. And indeed, many of the major wars 
in the modern European system were started by leading powers who wanted to become hegemons, which is a very different pattern uh, than power transition uh, suggests. Secondly, if we look to find order in the system, we find a pattern that lies somewhere between Walsh's description of anarchy and power transition's description of, uh, of order. We find some limited degree of order with rules and norms uh, which is obeyed uh, often to a surprising extent. Uh, these orders, in almost every case, emerge at the ends of wars, arise out of peace conferences, whether it was uh, the treaties of Westphalia or Utrecht or um, Versailles or the San Francisco conference. Many of the uh, principal features of the settlement arise reflecting the interests of great powers. But in fact, they almost inevitably represent a compromise among them in which each of the participating great powers receives something to reconcile it uh, to the new order. So negotiated orders are orders in which many of the powers therefore feel they have a vested interest in. And rather than opposing it, become supporters of it, even in circumstances where their power may increase uh, relative to who had been the dominant power at the time. And one very obvious example of this is the failure of hegemonic stability theory to explain the behavior of Germany and Japan in the 1970s when US power was perceived to be on a radical uh, decline in comparison to Germany and Japan. Rather than seeking to remake this economic system to benefit themselves, they invested time and money to help stabilize the system because they were benefiting from it. To assume the risk to try to change it was far too costly in the eyes of very sensible policymakers in both countries. If we turn now to the question of transition, uh, we find even more striking anomalies with the claims of power transition. The data set that Ben and I put together, we attempted to measure gross power. And to do this, we multiply population by size. The reason for this was until the 20th century for everybody but Britain who qualifies late in the 19th century. Uh, power was inevitably a function of agricultural surplus, not of trade or industry. Uh, that only becomes a major component very late in, in the game in the course of the modern European system. And agricultural output was a function of population and territory. So if we have a multiple of this, we have a good gross measure of capability. This is distinct from military capability because that reflects decisions that leaders make to spend money on buying armies and fleets. And one of the problems with uh, people who have attempted to test a power transition is that they've gone to the cow data set and they've taken the measures which are largely based on uh, military assets. We're looking, as power transition suggests we should, at gross uh, domestic product. When we look at this, we find in the first instance that there are uh, very few transitions. In fact, in Europe, there's only really one. In 1725, uh, Russia replaces the Spain and its empire as the dominant power. At that point, it has a, uh, a measure that's 24 times that of France, which is perceived as the dominant military power of the age, and indeed was. And that rises to 270 times uh, France uh, by the time you get to the year 1900. Uh, there is a second transition if you bring the United States into the system. In 1895, uh, the United States surpasses Russia. Then there's a third transition if we extend the measure internationally. In 1978, China surpasses the United States. 
So in fact, by raw measures of power, there are very few transitions, and none of these transitions led to war. Uh, we also look at changing in within the ranks of the great powers over the same period of time, and I won't go into that. The graphs and the discussion of it are, are in the paper. Uh, there are, again, only a few transitions. And what we find, uh, contrary to power transition theory, is that most of these transitions occur as the result of wars. Uh, they're not the causes of wars. They bring about the collapse of empires, uh, fundamentally. If we then look at the pattern of warfare, and in our paper we do this for each of the cases that the authors claim were caused by power transition, we find no evidence that power transition was a motive or concern of the leaders in the initiating states of these wars. They all went to war for a very different set of reasons. In fact, the pattern that emerges is somewhat different than either power transition or balance of power suggests. Historically, in the European system, great powers frequently go to war. Their principal targets are two. Once great powers that are declining, that are perceived relatively easy to pick off, and smaller states um, who can't possibly uh, do much against them. And when we look at rising powers, in our data set we have a category of rising powers, we look at the wars that they undertake, they pick on the same two targets. Declining great powers, case in point, the United States goes to war with the Spanish Empire in 1898. Uh, Russia goes to war with the, with the Ottomans. We find hardly any cases of rising powers and dominant powers going to war with one another. And the several cases we have are a result of a serious miscalculation of the other's power, as in the case of the Russo-Japanese War in 1945, or cases where a dominant power initiated a war against a declining power or smaller third party, which unexpectedly from its perspective, escalated into a wider war which brought it into confrontation with either a dominant power or a rising power. So from the perspective of initiators, neither power transition nor balance of power provide a good explanation. In each of the cases where the dominant powers went to war, they did so because they felt strong and they perceived what they thought was an opportunity to go from being a dominant power to a hegemon. In the case of the rising powers, they sought entry into the system and recognition as a great power. The way to do that was by military victory, so they picked on states uh, against whom they could demonstrate uh, this capability. This makes a lot more sense, and I'll stop my presentation here, if we think about international relations as a status hierarchy in which the great powers uh, have the dominant uh, uh, prestige and in return are called upon to enforce a certain degree of order in the system and rising powers want in and they get into the club by demonstrating that they're, they're very good at playing this game for the most part rather than being rejected they're admitted and they're given some degree of, uh, of recognition commensurate with their power. Where wars occur are in situations where leaders of the relevant states don't think that they're being rewarded with prestige consistent uh, with the status that they believe they have acquired. And that leads to a very different way of framing war uh, a question that I take up in my forthcoming book, but won't pursue any further here. Thank you very much.